and welcome to the episode 152 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today we will cover the stories that happened to the Beatles on the 1st of June, plus those that happened during the month, but for which we don't have a specific date. The first recording session of The Quarrymen, Sgt. Pepper's coming out in the UK, and the recording of the first Plastic Ono Band single are some of the highlights of the day. Let's start with what happened at some point in mid-1958. The Quarrymen, featuring George Harrison, John Lennon, John Duff Lowe and Paul McCartney, had their first recording session. The recording cost them 17 shillings and 6 pennies, about 18 pounds in 2020 money, for a two-sided shellac disc. Side A featured the cover of Buddy Holly's That'll Be The Day, while Side B contained the Harrison McCartney original, in spite of all the danger. John Lennon was the main singer for both numbers. The recording was partaken in the back room of a house in Kensington, Liverpool, by a man called Percy Phillips. At about the same time, one year later, in 1959, the skiffle craze was dying out fast in Liverpool and whatever opportunities for paid gig skiffle bands had was likewise becoming history. The quarrymen stopped practicing and performing, even for private parties. George Harrison began playing with another band, the Les Stewart Quartet. John Lennon and Paul McCartney spent time together at McCartney's house, starting to write songs. Of some of these songs, we just know the title. That's my woman, thinking of liking, years roll along, keep looking that way, just fun, and too bad about sorrows. Of some, like Looking Glass and Winston's Walk, we know some tiny details. These two were instrumentals, for example. Some of the songs will resurface at a later date, like Love Me Do, The One After 909, Hello Little Girl, When I'm 64, Hot Tut Sun, Cat's Walk, and I Lost My Little Girl, either with proper release during the Beatles' career or in bootlegged rehearsal sessions. On the 1st of June 1961, the Beatles, with Pete Bass on drums, performed another concert at the Top Ten Club in Hamburg, West Germany, for their second residency in town. Starting from June and throughout the 1962 summer session, Beatles manager Brian Epstein started booking the band on better and more exclusive venues, including an increasing number of out-of-Liverpool locations. Especially in the beginning of the process, though, there were quite a few small-town gigs. It's a long way to the top, as someone said. Well, it turns out that it wouldn't have taken that long from 1962. More or less one year later, in early summer 1963, the Beatles found themselves at the center of all the attentions of the music business. In fact, the band was making a sensation even outside the British music establishment, gathering national attention. The BBC had offered them their own 15-week radio show series, Pop Go The Beatles, as we saw in episode 120 and 144 of What A Fab Day, and the four weekly music papers Melody Maker, New Musical Express, New Record Mirror and Disc gave them incessant and increasing space in their columns. Also by that time, a host of teenage girl magazines, from Boyfriend to Valentine, ran regular features about the Fab Four and publishers started coming out with books and magazines specifically about the band. Even national television, particularly commercial networks, opened its doors to the lads. Talking about Pop Go The Beatles, on the 1st of June 1963, the Fabs were at the BBC Paris studio in London to record their second and third episode of the show. The second episode's guests were the Countrymen, while the Carter-Lewis duo was featured in the third. The Beatles performed these songs in the second show, aired on the 11th of June, between 5 and 5.29 pm. Too Much Monkey Business, I Got To Find My Baby, Young Blood, Baby It's You, 
Still There Was You and Love Me Do. For the third show, aired on the 18th of June between 5 and 5.29 pm, the song selection was A Shot of Rhythm and Blues, Memphis, Tennessee, A Taste of Honey, Sure to Fall in Love with You, Money, That's What I Want, and From Me to You. After the recording sessions, completed by 5.30 pm, the band reached the Granada Cinema in London for another night of performances with the Roy Orbison Package Tour. Exactly one year later, on the 1st of June 1964, the Beatles returned to the EMI Studio 2 in Abbey Road for three days of recordings to complete their next album, A Hard Day's Night, and an extra EP, Long Tall Sally. Today, they had a first session between 2.30 and 7.15 pm, and another between 8 and 11.15 pm. They recorded five takes of Matchbox, a total of eight takes for the two sections of I'll Cry Instead, six for part A and two for part B, six takes of Slow Down, and 16 of I'll Be Back. The work on I'll Be Back, starting with nine takes of bass and drums alone, and including an extra seven takes of overdubs, took all the evening session. Fun fact, Carl Perkins visited the studio during the afternoon session. The Beatles were thrilled having him watching their performance of Matchbox, one of Perkins' originals. At some point in June 1966, George Harrison first met sitar virtuoso Ravi Shankar at the house of Anya Deva Angadi, founder of the Asian Music Circle in London. On the 1st of June 1966, instead, the Beatles spent another 12 hours straight at the EMI Studios in Abbey Road. From 2.30 pm, aided by a host of assistants and friends, they recorded all kinds of overdubs onto Yellow Submarine, including the sound of John Lennon blowing bubbles into water using a straw, ocarina, coins scattered about, a foghorn, ship's bells, chatter, and so on. The overdubs were later mixed down to get out of the way of the remaining recordings to complete the song, and so, when the anthology version came out with the single Real Love in 1996, one could hear a fresh batch of sounds that were either never heard before or buried beneath other sounds. This included a spoken introduction recorded by Ringo during this session. The final chorus of the piece was sung by anyone in the studio at the time, Beatles assistants Mal Evans and Neil Aspinall, producer George Martin, engineer Jeff Emerick, Patty Harrison, Brian Jones, Marianne Faithful, the Beatles driver Alf Bicknell, and, naturally, George, John, Paul and Ringo. On the 1st of June 1967, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was released in the United Kingdom. The album was going to revolutionize the way albums were thought about in rock music. An LP would no longer be just a random collection of songs, but a piece of art that had to be well thought of and realized. EMI incurred in unheard of expenses to produce the album as the Beatles wanted. Sgt. Pepper's cover art alone cost more money than an entire album production would only a few years before. Everyone was paid back full dividends, though. The album went on selling 250,000 copies in UK during its first week on the shelves, and it remains, to this day, one of the top 10 albums of all times in terms of worldwide sales. The fact that the work had been recorded by musicians in their mid-twenties that only seven years before had problems finding decent bookings and that had never worked in a professional recording studio before 1961 is considered incredible to this day. But this was also a different world than the one we are accustomed to, in which popular music was still exploding and there were opportunities for experiments and risk-taking. 
The Beatles were incredibly talented, and by 1967, they had managed to make the most of all the chances they had been given, and that they had worked hard to get. Regardless of what you think of the album, this was probably the pinnacle of their career. But this is not all for the 1st of June 1967. While the rest of the world was taking notice of their new album, the Beatles returned to the Dale Lane Leah Studios in London, where, between 10.30 pm and 3.30 am, they recorded several instrumental jams, all untitled. This time, their producer George Martin was present. The work, though, was never released and was catalogued as subpar by Beatles historian Mark Lewison. The jams were unplanned, tedious, and rather amateurish. Lewison, in his The Complete Beatles Recording Sessions, comments, The single-minded channeling of their great talent so evident on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band did seem, for the moment, to have disappeared. Let's conclude the episode with some events happened on the 1st of June 1969. For a start, after attending the 30th of May session that could have concluded the work on the Get Back album, check out episode 150 of What A Fab Day for further information, George Harrison went on holiday in Sardinia with his wife Patty. They returned to London on the 23rd of June. Meanwhile, in Montreal, Canada, John Lennon and Yoko Ono were confronted with a rather hostile old cap, a cartoonist. Introducing himself as a dreadful Neanderthal fascist, he presented them with what was probably meant to be a witty put-down of their effort to promote peace, but that seems… well… A rather Neanderthal way of looking at the whole thing, even if you don't particularly like the couple or their bed-ins. I'll let Paul McCartney comment about the episode from the pages of the anthology book. I think John behaved very well there, because the guy is actually slagging off Yoko. And that's one thing you don't do. You don't slag off someone's missus. That's tribal time, isn't it? I think John was very good. It was, let's not sink to his level. Later on, at 10 pm, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, and many of the people in attendance to their bed in, including Allen Ginsberg, Abby Hoffman, Tommy Smothers, Timothy Lear, Pat Clark, Dick Gregory, Murray Decay, Derek Taylor, Rabbi Abram Feinberg, and members of the Radha Krishna Temple, recorded a new song by John. Give peace a chance. The recording was not programmed and it was taped on borrowed equipment, a four-track complex recorder and four microphones. The proceedings were handled by Andre Perry, owner of a local studio at the request of EMI. The song was quickly rehearsed before the recording and the whole deal might have taken 10 minutes at the most. The conditions, according to Perry, were less than ideal, to say the least. The room was really noisy, there was no acoustic setup, and he was under a lot of stress because, naturally, he wanted to make a good impression. Apparently, John Lennon noticed the effort Perry was putting into his work and trusted him with, and I quote Perry, all this liberty in the world on this thing. It was just totally amazing. When the recording was completed, everyone went away. On listening back to the tape for the first time, in his studio, Perry decided that the track would have been better if he could overdub some extra people singing the choir of the song, so that the roughness of the original recording could have been made more palatable to the average listener. Perry. The next day I went back to John, and they moved everybody out of the room and it was just the three of us with Yoko, and I played it for him, and he thought it was wonderful. Kept it as is. There's another story going around about overdubbing in London, England. Nothing was overdubbed in England. The actual 45 that existed originally is the actual recording. You see, the point of the matter, it's not that we wanted to cheat anything, 
It was a question of like, not usable, the condition was absolutely terrible. What we did is by taking the original stuff that was there and just adding a few voices in a cleaner environment. Give Peace a Chance was chosen to be the first single of the Plastic Ono Band, a conceptual band with no fixed personnel that John Lennon would eventually use as his outlet for songs he wouldn't or couldn't record with the Beatles. The B-side of the single was Remember Love, also recorded in the Lennon Suite by Perry. John was so happy about Perry's work to have his contact details printed on the label of the single for the international release. Perry was elated, and he certainly received an avalanche of requests after such publicity. Well, this concludes today's episode. If you fancy hearing about lots of different Beatles recording sessions, make a point of tuning in tomorrow and listen to the episode. In the meantime, you can do worse than checking out www.simonmas.com support to find out how you can help me to put out more and better music-related content. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.